Thank you so much, Reverend Cook. There was once a rabbi cook, chief rabbi of Israel. Maybe that's a, a relative. I should live so long. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Edelman. Is this working? Yeah. Yes, good. Uh, you've laid out before us, uh, Reverend Cook, a very interesting paradox. And I wonder if you could comment on it. And that is, um, the United States is the most religiously observant country, and certainly the most Christian country in terms of membership, affiliation, belief, practice, of any Western state. Um, and yet, uh, there is less anti-Semitism by almost any measurement in uh, the United States than there are in the, uh, uh, than there is in Europe, where in fact Christianity is quite weak today. So how do you sort of deal with this kind of paradox? If, if I were totally ignorant of other factors, I would just say on the basis of this, well, there's not much relationship today between Christianity and hostility to Jews, since in the most Christian country is the least hospital, hostile, and the uh, least Christian countries, that is the countries of Western Europe, are the most hostile. If you worked, uh, is, uh, this is not a comeback or a, uh, but I work with people listen to people, live among people. Uh, and I can tell you that for all the reasons I have laid out, I think, uh, no, there's no, there's not so much overt anti-Semitism. In fact, ADL publishes a, a, a directory annually of how many incidents there have been. And one is appalling, two is an outrage, but uh, there aren't many. But, but I hear people talk uh, and I think that it's covert and it's dangerous. I'm thankful that it's not overt, is my answer. Please. Well, I just want to actually follow up on uh, Todd's uh, comment. Um, if I might uh, quote to the very Reverend Cook. Um, the <laughs> Enough with the Reverend already. Uh, the, um, a study that was published in that noted uh, journal of religion, USA Today, uh, <laughs> appeared actually, and uh, lest you think that I read this uh, on a regular basis, it's because I'm staying at the hotel here, so they gave it to me this morning. Excuses, and, excuses. <laughs> and it reported the following, which I think is of interest both to this particular discussion, but also to the project of secular humanistic Judaism, a poll of the American people. 48% believe that God is a spirit who might uh, also assume a human form, so they would qualify presumably as orthodox under the Council of Nicaea. 27% said that God is a spirit who never takes human form, they're heretics. 10% said God is uh, a human being with a body, and only 10% said there is no God. So, I mean, this reinforces uh, Todd, what Todd said, and, and I think it's it interesting to ponder the question of, um, since Jews, in fact, and not only secular humanistic Jews, generally have very lin little interest in theology, that is, the question about whether God has a body or not is not one that preoccupies Jews for the most part. Um, whether this, to what extent this sort of um, cultural uh, profile religious profile of America, what, to what extent this affects the way American Christians think about Jews? There was a question That's mark. a question oh, at the right. end. That is, to what extent does this, this sort of theological preoccupation, it's clear something like 85% of Americans believe in God and in a God that has, you know, where they actually think about the question of what form the God takes. To what extent does this influence the way they think about Jews? Unclear. I, I want to go back to the, the poll. Uh, uh, I spent some time uh, in my earlier years on 
what's known as a copy desk of a daily newspaper, we had to write the headlines. And uh, I'm thinking of what headline I might write over that poll story, and it would probably be two words, more insight. <laughs> polls, uh, polls make me itch. Uh, uh, you know, some polls say that 98% of, of people believe in God, and others, 89% you know, say there's an after. I don't know what to say about polls. Um, uh, to what extent does this overwhelming belief thing affect how Christians relate to it's Jews? It's another way of asking the question that, that Todd asked, but I'm asking it more from the theological angle. I must be I must be weary because I, I st still don't quite get the question. But, but let me let me attempt. Um, uh, one of the uh, I don't know whether it was a privilege or an opportunity, but it was sure weird. Uh, during my years as religion editor at the Free Press, that coincided pretty much with the, uh, uh, the zenith of the at least public. Uh, and publicly admitted effect upon politics of the religious right, such luminaries as Jerry Falwell and Jimmy Baker and Pat Robertson, all of whom I know um, to some degree. Um, they call themselves, or they call themselves the moral majority, and we all scoffed at that because they weren't the majority at all, but in fact, in fact, uh, there's a kind of an underground majority of people uh, I think in this country, uh, who resonate well with the uh, uh, sort of simplistic beliefs of evangelical Christianity. Uh, those are a lot of people who support George W. Bush, I think, and some of his initiatives, the faith-based initiatives especially. And uh, uh, again, it, it's a covert thing. Uh, but I think unexamined, uncritical belief that admits of no ambiguity or nuance is dangerous to anybody, including Jews. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Well, I think we can illustrate, I want to illustrate, I think, what, what people have been getting at with just a very concrete story. I had the uh, interesting experience of living, as, as Todd did, I guess, at one point in Bloomington, Indiana. And uh, back in 1987, Indiana University hired a new president, a guy named Thomas Ehrlich, or Ehrlich. And uh, when he moved to Bloomington to assume his position as president, uh, he was approached by every church in town because nobody knew what denomination he was. They had to join something. It turned out he was a Jew, first Jewish president in the history of Indiana University. Um, and he'd said, well, I'm, he'd never belonged to a community, religious community in his life. He'd been, I think, the provost of the law school or something at Stanford where he didn't feel any need to have a religious affiliation. But when he got to Indiana, he had to. He had to belong to the church of his choice, so he joined the synagogue. And this struck me as a quintessentially American thing to do. He came to the synagogue twice a year, on the eve of the New Year and on uh, Kol Nidre, the eve of Yom Kippur. He came for the first year of Kol Nidre. He promptly fainted dead away during the confession, during the Vidui, uh, probably from overwork and lack of sleep. We were all convinced there was going to be a pogrom against the Jews of Bloomington. What I'm getting at is that this action of someone who had previously been unaffiliated in a very different environment in the uh, American uh, Pacific Northwest or Bay Area comes to the heartland, joins a synagogue, and is completely accepted, so far as I could tell, by you know the mainstream Christian community. I'm not talking about evangelicals who have their own interesting support for Jews based on their eschatological uh, plans. But this was across the board. Uh, because he had chosen to wear his religion on his sleeve and to join the synagogue. And this gets back to the points I think that Todd and David are making. This is quite unique to the United States. Um, so how you deal with that within the framework of an anti-Semitism that's religiously inspired. I don't know. So he joined the synagogue, and it's a quintessential American thing to do. Did he not want to join the synagogue? Was he, do you think, uh, do you have data that would s suggest that he was or felt coerced by circumstances? He didn't talk much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to follow suit. <laughs> Can I 
Professor Bowen. In actual fact, I don't think there's much, um, much of a contradiction between uh, the statements of uh, Todd and, uh, and uh, Harry Cook because uh, what uh, Harry Cook said very clearly was that there was a covert kind of feeling, what we call in the uh, discussion about anti-Semitism, latency. And the latency is, and I completely agree with uh, what he said here, is certainly due to um, a theological development. However, that doesn't start with Christianity. It starts prior to that. And I have always been asking myself why people like Irenaeus or Cyprian or, or Origen or, or these other people, why was their teaching accepted? In other words, was there some resonance to this anti-Jewish sentiment that they were developing and producing? And I think that that has to be the prior question. And uh, I feel that it is because of that what I called last night the difference uh, in the Jewish culture and civilization compared to the other options that people had in the <coughs> Roman Empire. Because the same options did not exist, for instance, in the uh, area of Persian control, where there never was any anti-Semitism. And so I think you are absolutely right, that you, they picked up on something that happened there. And my question, is somehow connected with that, and that is, there is a scholar in Jerusalem, a Welsh Protestant, who publishes, uh, published, I don't think, I'm not sure he's still alive, uh, despite his name, he's Welsh, not Jewish, uh, Malcolm Lowy, uh, who uh, published what, to, what for me was an eye-opener. He delved into, because he knows uh, Greek and, 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 and Latin and Aramaic and so on and so forth, he delved into the literature of uh, Palestine in those years around the appearance of, I think he lived, I think he died, I think, you know, uh, J Jesus or Yeshua. And it, it, it's clear that there was a tremendous fight going on, internal Jewish fight between Galileans and Judeans. And when the New Testament, which only exists uh, in its uh, uh, Greek translation, speaks about the Jews who accused Jesus, they talk about Judeoi. In other words, they talk about Judeans. And Jesus was a Galilean. And he feels that there is a great deal to be said for the theory that this was the result of an internal Jewish quarrel between two sects within traditional Judaism as it was understood then, because of course Jesus was a Pharisee. and. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, what, what was later said that he was against the Pharisees, it was an internal fight, it was an internal quarrel. I wonder how you would relate to that. One's worst nightmare is to have someone like Dr. Bauer on your dissertation committee. <laughs> uh, a person, a person whom you uh, uh, grow to love and esteem, and uh, it scares you. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, let me take it, I mean, your questions are so comprehensive, uh, let me take it in bits and pieces. Uh, you said, of course, Yeshua or Jesus was a Galilean, of course he was a Pharisee. Well, actually we don't know any of that, uh, despite Mel Gibson's, uh, uh, <laughs> we know how he is depicted in these various documents. Uh, he, he certainly appears to be a Pharisee. Uh, the way he, the, the words that are put on his lips in the <coughs> Gospel of John certainly makes him appear to be a Pharisee. And it is said that he's from Galilee. Um, uh, and maybe that's true. Um, it's clear that John the Baptist was, was a Judean, uh, at least from all the evidence. Um, so it, it was an internal an internal squabble, an internal uh, internal quarrel, uh, and what was the next question? That was the question. <laughs> yeah, but what about the internal quarrel? Well, is then the uh, the uh, uh, story that is related to the New Testament related to that quarrel? Oh, sure. I, I, if I omitted somehow to say that, 
uh, th then it is a, it's a grievous submission. I think so. And, I mean, there's a point then, right, that you would go on with? Well, I would say that the uh, later interpretation of the New Testament that accuses the Jews, as yes. in Matthew, accuses the, the Jews, as in John, yes. uh, is then a, uh, a denial of the original story oh. which they had in their hands. Yes. That's a good point. Yeah. I wanted to add a, a footnote to that point, um, and actually to... Uh, something that you have said about uh, the later church fathers. Um, in fact, uh, I don't think that the later church fathers, uh, or at least some of them anyway, were simply creating this as a theoretical anti-Jewish argument. Uh, if you take a look, for example, at Chrysostom, uh, who lives in, uh, was Bishop of Antioch, um, his problem is a very simple one. His congregants are going to the synagogue down the street and he wants to stop them from doing this. So there, there is an actual conflict between Jews and Christians, and more to the point, there is an ambiguity as to who is a Jew and who is a Christian. You could be both a Jew and a Christian. Um, even if you were ethnically not Jewish, you could go to the synagogue. And that appears to be the social context in which Chrysostom comes up with his sermons, which are, as Yehuda correctly said yesterday, could have been taken out of their Sturmer. Um, so there is an actual conflict that goes on for centuries, which is a real conflict as to which religion here is going to be, uh, going to be dominant. Thank you for that, uh, uh, which uh, leads me to say that my pal Irenaeus appears from the textual evidence that I've seen, uh, he was less concerned with demonizing Jews than he was for making his point, which ended up demonizing Jews. So it was for Irenaeus and uh, uh, people around him in that time, it was a, it was a sort of a byproduct, uh, not a good one, but a byproduct. But I think you're right about, I mean, the, the synagogue down the street from uh, Chrysostom, the Golden Tongues Church. If I could just add one more uh, comment. What I think is interesting is the way, what, what we've, we've come to the realization that uh, most of the West inherited a common Christian, uh, common Christian traditions and teachings about Jews, but the way in which those teachings and uh, myths had an impact was very, very different. And again, to refer to something that Yehuda said earlier today, uh, America really uh, has been different. That the whole notion of uh, belonging the category of belonging in America is very different than that in historically in most European states. Uh, and because of that, uh, in a sense, there's been less play, less area, uh, less space for the negative aspects of Christian teaching and myths about Jews to have a, a real influence. Uh, it, it's never, it seems to me, it's never just a study of what's the influence or what is the teachings of Christianity, but precisely how much space or are there, or are there countervailing beliefs that tend to mute those. Uh, I mean, at the moment, I think uh, West Europeans show a greater willingness to use Christian myths, even though they are not very Christian anymore. And I don't mean in the sense that they're not being kind, but they're simply not believing Christians. But for other reasons, these myths have a lot, and tropes and things have much greater resonance in Europe than they do today. I'd just like to say one thing in closing. Uh, or do you, do you well, but we, we have a few more minutes. I just, uh, I just think it'll take uh, about 15 seconds. All morning long, I sat on your left, which is where I belong, and oddly enough, uh, this colloquium has brought me to the center where I'm very uncomfortable. <laughs> anyway, Harry, I, I always love to listen to you, and um, what I loved about what you had to say was the passion and, I mean, and the obvious sincerity that was behind it, as, as well as the learning. Uh, I think one of the questions that, that was addressed to you um, is important because in the United States of America, 
where there is certainly more overt Christianity than there is in, in Europe presently, Western Europe, um, there seems to be far less overt anti-Semitism, even, uh, even if latent. And uh, I, I have asked myself that, that question, you know, why? Um, certainly one would imagine that the greater secularization of society and the, the decrease in the power of the Christian church would enhance uh, the security of, uh, of the Jew. Um, but in this country where people go to churches all the time, um, it seems to be uh, a more benign environment. I would just like to comment, you know, in um, in support of what you uh, of what you had to say. I think America is different because a, a major change occurred in the society um, before World War II, which I remember very vividly. America had an ethnic character. There was something called an American, and that meant an Anglo, a person of Anglo-Saxon descent. And they generally had last names like Cooper, Hooper, Tooper, whatever they were. I don't know. <laughs> and in fact, the image of American was ethnic. When I when I lecture to wasps, I tell them they're ethnic. They have ethnic food. They have ethnic manners. They, uh, they have ethnic style. They don't think of themselves as ethnic. They're an ethnicity. And in fact, they were the overwhelming majority of the people in this country. And they made a mistake, and they also didn't make a mistake. If they had wanted to preserve this country as an ethnic preserve of wasps, they should never have allowed all of us, <laughs> no, no, to come in. What has happened in the United States of America is that the former majority in this country has become a very distinct minority. It's, when I was a child, even, it was hard for me to find a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. In metropolitan Detroit, they had sort of moved out to the suburbs. So America had to develop a new strategy for defining the nation. And it already started before World War uh, II. Uh, and that relates to Yehuda's statement about, in England, you can be a Jew for eight, you know, eight generations. You're still a what? You're a Jew. But you, you, don't, you don't become uh, English or France or French because there is an ethnic, there's an ethnic character to that identity. But in the United States of America, to make it function, what had to happen was you had to redefine what it meant to be an American. And what it meant to be an American was now related to ideology. So when people said, what is America? America is a freedom. America is democracy. You know, it's, it's, it's a statement of ideology, not a statement of, uh, of ethnicity. And the only reason why America works is because certainly in the white population, this was not extended, by the way, to blacks and Latinos. But we, suddenly the word after World War II emerged. It's the word white. So what unites all whites? Are, well, there, there, there's a racial distinction. But what about all these different ethnicities in white? And now, it, now it's just white. And in fact, the Jews have made it. The Jews who used to be not white. <laughs> no, no. And that's why we're all out here in Bloomfield Hills and Birmingham. We're, we're, we're now white, and in fact, um, the WASP establishment has uh, now intermarries with, uh, with, the Jewish, uh, with the Jewish establishment. And their old preserves, like the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, they open up the Max. And you go there, and seven-eighths of the people who made the contribution to the building of, <laughs> of that building indeed are Jews. And they're all dining and singing and whatever else it is. So now you have to find a new way of defining an American because uh, the old, narrow, ethnic Anglo-Saxon definition uh, doesn't apply. In Germany, you can still say the German ethnicity. In France, you can still say the what? The French ethnicity. In North America now, we keep using this word all the time, multicultural. I'm glad they let us in. And once they let us in, we didn't take over. <laughs> but we, cer no, we certainly have done very, very well. And so in, in the United States of America, the ethnic definition of America all right, has gone. That isn't true in England. It isn't true in France. It isn't true in Germany. It isn't true in Italy. And what Jews encounter in many of these countries, is that what you're describing, is this, uh, the ethnic stranger. Right? You, you, it's very hard to cross that barrier. That is not true anymore. There was a time when that was true, by the way. Because before World War II, uh, there, was very, there was political anti-Semitism. 
uh, in this country, and it was centered even in the city of Detroit. So uh, what, uh, what, what I think makes the difference, all right, in, in terms of the American scene, because it's one of the questions, is that um, that old ethnic, ethnic definition uh, is now gone. And the, the second thing which I'd like to, um, to say uh, is if indeed uh, the Jews are more accommodated because the ethnic de definition is more open, um, we still have to account for the fact that in a Christian uh, a society which is overtly very Christian, uh, there is a decrease uh, or a, a limit uh, to the power of anti-Semitism. And this now comes to one of the ideas that Todd uh, brought out, um, which is that maybe, it's certainly true that Christianity is responsible for the demonization of the Jew. But it may be the case that once having entered into the culture, there are other factors that preserve, do I there are other factors that preserve the demonization of the Jew, and one of them, which nobody seems to have alluded to too clearly, I mean, I just, is the economic factor. I mean, one of the reasons for the, ladder, the, 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 the Fourth Lateran Council was not that simply the Jews were defined as the enemies of Christ. It was that the Jews, through their choice, uh, compelled, whatever it was, had assumed an economic role in the European economy, which was provocative and hateful and so forth. And uh, Todd spoke about the, the discomforts of capitalism, of, you know, of, of Jews being, being very successful, uh, freely successful in this environment. Is it possible that now, at, in the beginning of the 21st century, the demonization of the Jew, which began, let's say, before the Christian church and certainly aggravated by the Christian church, has now moved out of that? into a something else because uh, when Mahathir Muhammad talked about the Jew, um, it's true there were elements of Islam that, that could support the hostility, but he spoke about the fact that the Jews ran the, e the, econ do you know ran the economy of the world. You're, you're, we're now into another issue. That is, Christianity is there. But there has to be something more, otherwise we can't account for, do you understand, this preserva the preservation of it, certainly in the Western, we can account for it in terms of the Muslim world or the radical Islam, but what about its preserv the preservation of it in this world? So what I think you did, which was very important for us, is to give us this very good history of how Christianity has contributed to the demonization of the Jew and what is most important to me is that you gave to us your love and your friendship for us. So thank you very much. Just one point. Uh, you and I disagree about hardly anything. Uh, but um, I'm not as convinced as you are that this country is necessarily becoming more secular uh, I think you see more secular people than I I didn't say that was becoming more secular. Okay. No, no. <laughs> not, this, not this country, Europe. I thought you said, all right, no, because no. if you did, I would be wrong. No, no, I didn't say that. But I think, I think, I think we're talking about, it, about an archetypal image that, as you say, the early Christians created. And as uh, Professor Bauer says, it even predated it, even predates early Christianity, and you've beautifully elucidated for us how, how, how it got developed so much more sali saliently uh, by the early Christian church. But once it becomes uh, an archetypal image in the mind of not just Western society, let's keep in mind, but also the Muslims as well, I think it's regardless of religiosity that, that, uh, that hostility is, uh, is maintained. And that's what I hear you saying, really. And we thank you very much for your, for your uh, only 10 minutes being our wonderful kindred spirit. Thank you so much.